will take seriously uh, Chris's uh, request that uh, we talk about this and have a discussion, and I will never forego an opportunity to educate a Republican one at a time. <laughs> I think most of my colleagues, when they come to this, really were open to everything and anything new. So I thought that um, I'll give, I'll provide this opportunity to to help us understand the expansion of Medicaid. Now, that seems to be a extraordinary, strong opportunity for Iowa and for every state. But as you know, um, the Supreme Court did allow the expansion of Medicaid, but what? They ruled was that every state has to make that determination itself, and that no governor can do it unilaterally. Uh, 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 it's going to take a legislative uh, decision and a, a waiver, probably, with a referral signature. So it's really one of those issues where we have to work together. <laughs> Expanding Medicaid. Um, means that we'll be able to insure more people for a longer period of time, reduces the health care costs for everyone. This is what we really have to understand, the, the amount of dollars that will come into this state. If you could, and I've been working with our staff on how we frame this, but basically when you have $851 million in uncompensated care that your hospitals alone have to, um, have to fund, that loss is literally being replaced by the premiums we pay in our health insurance. So if we have more people who are now insured, like Medicaid expanded population, you'll be able to lower costs for everyone, eventually. And that's that $851 million of uncompensated care is just the care that hospitals get. Say nothing for charity care at community health centers or other physicians and other providers. The New England Journal just released a report today that said expanding Medicaid will save lives. So it's not just a budget issue. If we reduce this to a budget issue, then we have failed as legislators. We can go in there and pass a budget if all we care about is balancing the budget. It's really balancing priorities. That's what a budget does. It means making hard decisions. Now, Iowa already had an expanded Medicaid program. It's called Iowa Care. It was created under Lieutenant Governor Sally Peterson and Governor Tom Wilson under a divided legislature. Republicans controlled the House. Actually, they controlled both houses at the time, the House and Senate. And it passed, I think, here you When we took the toxic issue of politics and health care away, we had we had a strong bipartisan support led by a governor, lieutenant governor, that made this a priority. I would care succeed. It moved 70,000 islands from the what we call the Iowa state papers program. It was really kind of our charity care. And everybody who had got sick and got into the state papers program had to go to Iowa City. Well, because of the leadership of Broglon's Medical Society and Mindy Steer is here, Mindy was thrown into that. She was the communications director in the midst of a transition of CEOs. Their CEO was uh, Sid um, and, and was the replacement had not arrived yet. Nikki took it upon herself with this leadership of, of the Broadlands Hospital to let us use their tax base, their property tax base that they get. It's the only hospital in the state that has taxes delivered directly to them. And we use that along with Iowa City to provide a match for the state fund for the federal government. So we were able to draw down more federal funds. And by the way, the federal government did commit themselves, and they have followed through and paid on their share every year. So we haven't expanded Iowa, Iowa already. So when politicians say, I'm not sure we want to expand Medicaid, this goes away in 2014. So not only do you decide not to expand it, you're literally 
telling 70,000 Iowans they no longer have health care. But guess what? Good news. Two years ago, we asked the Department of Human Services to follow the money. Can you tell us how much will be saved in Medicaid, Medicaid and other programs related to the Affordable Care Act? Right after the bill was signed, um, we made that request, and the Department went forward. They have reports. One issued in March of 2011, the other one issued in December of 2011. What do you think it's that? It says, Iowa State's budget may actually save $72 million over the first eight years of implementation. It goes on and said there are two scenarios that they put together, a middle scenario and a low scenario. Under the low scenario, basically 114,000 new islands would be covered, and that they calculated it would save the state $72 million about $8 million a year the first eight years. Remember that first eight years, the federal government picks up 100% of the Medicaid cost the first three years, and then it's ratcheted down to 90%. At the eighth year, the state then picks up the 10% uh, that the law requires. The impact in Iowa is 114,000 under the low scenario and 182,000 under the medium scenario. They had also calculated a high scenario in their first report, but in their second report, Jennifer would be more clear on this, that was eliminated because the assumptions uh, were no longer relevant for going to the future because of the economy and other factors. And that report was, was developed by a, a private consulting firm in, in Millinet, and it's on our website. It's also on the DA uh, Department of Human Services website. They released that this morning. So you can only go to the Senate Democratic website or the Department of Human Services website. Um, <clears throat> we talked about reducing health care costs for everyone. It, it's, a, it's a complicated economic um, strategy and, and formula. Uh, people will be looking at it over and over again, except that one thing we have to remember on this report it is exhaustive in the terms of its assumptions, but each of its assumptions and the final conclusion is parallel, not almost identical, to the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, the Urban Institute, the Kaiser Report, and the Urban Institute. All these reports on a national level, their calculations, when we look at it, are parallel to what this report says about the expansion of Medicaid, its cost to the state, and its, uh, its ability to uh, bring in new uninsured Americans. Now, here's the interesting part. If you take the medium scenario, the one that said that we would have 182,000 more islands insured, that comes out as an average for the first eight years to be $161 per person per year. That's what it will cost <coughs> to fund 182,000 islands. Now tell me you can't afford that. If you look at big numbers, $30 million, that's big. It scares us. When you break it down to 182,000 islands for eight years, it's $161. Chris, that's the number you need to go back to your people with. Because I believe once we once we break it down, once we see what it does to each of us, and how it affects islands, individually, not the institution, not a political party, not a hospital, not a doctor, but how it affects us. To you as the consumers, to Chris and me, they're both. You break down to that level. We do that really well in elections. When you break it down to the individual person, $161,000, they should be over. The nice thing about it, it is a deal in which it's a better deal than I would care. The cost shares is 
different under Iowa care at the 60-40 match here. We have 73, 7%. That's the average of the first eight years. <coughs> After the eighth year, it's a 90-10 match. You know, it's really a question of priorities, not a question of budget. The budget's going to reflect our values. The budget reflects our priorities. We can't afford $161 per person per year to ensure the most unhealthy islands get into preventive care, to eliminate potential chronic diseases, and take care of those that have it now. And where are our values? I think the, the argument that the federal government hasn't been able or won't be able to fulfill its obligation is a bit of a difficult one for me to understand. In 250 some odd years, the federal government has fulfilled all of its obligations. Our liberties we shall maintain. Our freedom is not going to be lost. And why do we make health care a different a different sense of values than education. We fund education for our children. And even private schools find a way to educate their children. Church schools, parochial schools, public schools, we find ways to educate our children. We don't complain that the federal government, the state government, or our school boards aren't going to fund issues. Those kids always have education. I question the quality of the education, but every door is open in the state. Why, why all of a sudden we use the argument, well, health care, can't trust the federal government. The dramatic reduction is uncompensated care. Now, we'll use one example in the next slide uh, for hospitals. But at lower cost for privately insured Iowans who have private insurance, because it is a shift from hospitals that lose all this money for charity care because uninsured Iowans are going to the emergency room. It's so structurally embedded in them that they go there for non-emergency care. And so that's their, that's their medical home, is the insurance, is the um, emergency room. Affordable Care Act and Iowa's health care reform shifts all that. Because you're not going to the emergency room just because your child is sick or you're sick. You go to the emergency room because you think you're not. That's what emergency is. You can't get to be a doctor. Under the new Affordable Care Act, under the new structures of Mercy Hospital, Iowa Health Systems, putting together medical homes, you no longer will be, gee, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I can't get it. I can't. I've got to go to the emergency room. No, 4 o'clock in the morning in a, in a system that's being proposed is that there may be a clinic you can get to. You don't have to be stuck in rural Iowa and say, I can't travel 80 miles to the hospital. No, you could, you could travel 12 miles to your doctor. Because in a medical home situation, in the ACO, careful, accountable care organizations, they have to have provisions where you open 24 hours a day. And if you need to go to a specialist, you go there. If you need to go to a non-physician, they have them there. You don't and you won't be ever turned down. So when you have all these hospitals, $851 million in charity care, oh, well, there they are, huh? That's a huge network. And those hospitals, by law, have to provide you. So when that's reduced to maybe just bad debt, and the bad debt can be just lowered dramatically as well, you then have a savings. And your insurance companies will reflect that in your premiums. Expanding Medicaid is for every island, not just those that are uninsured. Now, I've been known to be partisan. This is not my next slide. <laughs> my next slide is to be harsh on candidates for the legislature. Democrats and Republicans. You need to ask them if they, if they support expanded Medicaid. And if they don't know enough about it, you have to educate them. If they 
they say, no, I'm not committed to that, then they're not committed to Iowa values. This is what this means. Once you help those who are uninsured, my presentation, at least I'm trying to draw the parallel that you're helping every Iowa. So now I'm going to reward you for those that are PG-13. Not to look at the next slide. And those adults of us can understand that we have the two top Republican leaders in the Senate, Senator Bain and Senator Zahn, two years ago, introduced Senate File 111 that cut Hawkeye enrollment by 26,000 kids. Now, if legislative leaders are willing to cut Hawkeye and throw 26,000 kids from their insurance policy, what's the likelihood that they're going to expand This is not just a discussion between me and you. This has to be a discussion between you and your friends, your spouses, your kids. And more importantly, this has to be a discussion now with our candidates because it is not theoretical. It is not question of constitutionality. This is constitution. It is the law of the land. And for politicians to say we're going to repeal it without telling you with what, I think we have an obligation to demand more. So that's the that's the second thing I'd like to share this to share with you. The first was the report, which uh, Jennifer uh, Vermeer is going to go into. It's a thorough report. And it provides us a little bit of uh, opportunity to see what do the economists, poly, poly, policy analysts, how do they look at it? And is it a report that is just kind of Iowa specific? Well, it is Iowa specific, but it's parallel with all the other nonpartisan reports that have been issued by agencies and, and nonprofits like the Congressional Budget Office, working with the Institute, Blue and Group, and others. We have an opportunity here really to educate our elected officials. And I want to thank Andy and Chris uh, for not making me a liar. This is the summit I've been asking for. <laughs> there you go. I'll do it. But I do appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you. And uh, thank you for inviting